emotions are an important part of our lives. They're a vital part of our lives. There's nothing we think, nothing we do, nothing we say that really is not emotional in some sense. But we want to make sure you have the good feelings. And, and by that, we just don't mean positive feelings, happy feelings. We mean the kind of feelings that God wants you to have, the feelings that God created you to have. And so just a little bit of review before we get into today's message. We started off by recognizing the foundational place for everything is the fact that our God has emotions. You may not think about that. You look in Scripture, you can think God has a will, God has a mind, God makes choices. But God feels, and we talked about many of those places in the Scripture where God expresses emotions. And then we recognize the fact that we are created in God's image. And because we are in God's image, we are going to have emotions too. When originally created, our emotions were in perfect alignment with God and with our mind and with our wills. They felt the right things because we thought the right things and we did the right things. But sin came into the world. The sin that came into the world with Adam and Eve's disobedience brought a certain measure of disorder and corruption. No longer did our minds think cor correctly. They became corrupted. No longer were our wills following God the way they were supposed to. And then our emotions became disordered. But the good news is that Jesus came to die not only to forgive our sins, but also begin that process of restoration. For once again, our mind would think God's thoughts, our emotions would express the right feelings, and we would do the right things. Well, today we want to begin to talk about some tactics and how we can make our emotions an ally, not an enemy. An ally, not an enemy. And today, more than usual, we're going to look at a lot of different Bible verses. And I want to do that because I want to point out some of the things that I say are clearly back up by scripture and to start off we want to make this point god cares about what you feel and actually commands you how to feel i don't know if you've ever thought about that to be honest with you i'm not sure i've ever thought about that a whole lot until i i decided to do this message on emotions certainly i know that god has commanded us to think certain things and god has also commanded us to do certain things but scripture makes it clear that god commands us to feel a certain way God wants us to use our emotions, and our emotions are simply expressions of what we're feeling, what we're thinking inside, what we're evaluating inside, how we're seeing reality. God wants us to express particular emotions because God wants us to think and feel and evaluate a certain way inside. And God has a plan for your emotions. Just like God has a plan for your mind and for your behaviors, God also has a plan for emotions. He wants us to bring our emotions under the authority of God's word, just like he wants us to bring our behavior under God's authority and our thoughts under God's authority. So we want to cultivate godly emotions. We want to cultivate the good feelings. And let's then look at some of the things the Bible says that God commands us to feel. Now, there's a lot of them. In fact, I had twice as many on my list initially, and I got to go back and say, this message is too long. I've got to narrow it down. So I've narrowed it down to just a few, but there are more you can find in Scripture. And the first one I want us to acknowledge that God's commands is this. God commands joy. God commands us to be joyful. God commands us to rejoice, which is what it means to be joyful, is to rejoice. Listen to some of the places in Scripture where God makes that command. Jesus speaking in Matthew 5, 12, Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Notice the passage very clearly says that we are to rejoice and be glad. Philippians 4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now, you're probably thinking, that's, I can see that's a command, but you know what? That's not really my nature. But you know what? Just like our nature isn't always to obey God and do what God wants us to do, there are commands for us to be honest, even though sometimes I want to tell lies. So there's a command to be joyful. So we need to obey the command to be joyful just as much as we need to obey the command not to steal. We're commanded to love. Now, I've talked about many times that love is not just a feeling, that love is looking at other people and be at and uh, doing for them what is the best thing for them, to have goodwill toward them. And I've kind of downplayed the emotional aspect of love because some people think love is just a feeling. When the Bible, love is not just a feeling, but it certainly is also a feeling. In the Bible, the command to love is a command to do what is best for other people. But the Bible also says that we are to love in such a way that we express a feeling or an emotion toward other people. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you've purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. 
Did you hear that? We're supposed to love each other, and that means do good toward each other, but we're all supposed to do it deeply from the heart, meaning there should be a feeling that goes along with that behavior. Or Romans 12.10 in the New Living Translation. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Notice it's just not loving, but having a genuine affection toward other people. That's a feeling that comes along with the right behaving. Zeal. There's a command to be uh, zealous in terms of following God. That sounds a little strange, but really it's there. Listen to it. Romans 12, 11, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. It's not just serve the Lord. It's to do it in a very well with a lot of enthusiasm. In fact, if you look at the New Living Translation, it says it this way. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Notice enthusiastically is not just say serve God, kind of out of drudgery, you know, because you have to, out of a duty. It's like serve him enthusiastically. There is an emotional aspect to service. Now, obviously, we have a little bit different temperaments, and what's enthusiastic for you may not be enthusiastic for me, but it needs to have enthusiasm nonetheless in serving the Lord. Desire. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 2. Like newborn babies crave, now notice crave is strong, crave pure spiritual milk, so that you may grow up in your salvation. Now, when you talk about crave, you're talking about a real intense desire or passion for something. If you've been around babies, and when they're hungry, they are hungry, and they crave milk, they crave some, some satisfaction. And uh, if you've ever been in a house with a baby, you'll know in the middle of the night, they'll wake up crying because they're hungry, and they, they wake everybody up because they are so emotional about getting their need met. Nothing indifferent, nothing dispassionate, nothing stoic about a hungry baby when it comes to craving the milk. So we're supposed to have that same kind of passion and emotion toward God's word. And then one more before we move on today, tenderheartedness. We're commanded to be tenderhearted. That's certainly an emotional type feeling behavior. Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. The NIV uses the word compassionate there, being compassionate toward one another, but it just conveys the same concept, that there is an emotional attachment that God wants us to have toward each other. You see, the same God who commands behaviors, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, also commands emotions, and that's challenging. You know, God also, though, commands us to, accept, to exercise self-control. It's just not emotion anyway, anyhow, but he wants us to exercise our emotions in a way that are under control. And nobody really likes to hear to exercise self-control. You know, even among Christians, we want to say, I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it, where I want it. There's this that natural tendency. We want to be able to think what we want to think, feel whatever we want, do whatever we want to do. But in the Bible, God commands us to express emotions, but also to exercise self-control. Let me read a few verses that tell us that. 2 Peter 1.5, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness. Notice there's that growth in terms of the character and emotions that God wants us to express. And part of that is, yes, you're supposed to express emotions. You're supposed to think a certain way. You're supposed to have certain desires in your heart. And those are then are supposed to be expressed a certain way. But it's a way that's under self-control. Self-control is a gift of God. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I like how that progression's there. He gave us a spirit, not of fear, okay, but of power. We need power to do the right things, to do what God wants. We need love to motivate us to do that. But notice self-control there. Love and power come together to be what God wants when they're exercised with self-control. And then as we know, self-control is a fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Notice how scripture describes the spirit's work in our life will produce character fruit that is also emotional, but also is governed by self-control. Now, we want to know, how do I get help self-control? How does that become part of my life? Well, in the Bible, renewing the mind is a key to exercising self-control. And one of the classic passages that describe this is Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Let me read that for you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, 
holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Notice to offer our bodies in obedience and service and the proper expression of motions is really described here as being worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Notice that we're called here to choose to have our minds to be renewed, to not to be governed by the desires of our flesh, but to be, dis- be governed by the mind as guided by God's word. Our bodies are not to be offered into our desires and do whatever our desires want us to do, but we are to do what God wants us to do. We're to use our mind to be reasonable and make good judgments. Our emotions are to be under the control of God's word and God's spirit and good emotional choices. You see, the Bible gives us authoritative commands and how we're to feel, not just how we're to behave and how we are to think. Now, some of you are probably saying, well, that's nice, Jeff. We can have that command to be joyful. We can have that command to love other people. But you know what? You might as well tell me to fly because I just can't do that. I am struggling. You want me to be joyful? I just can't do that. To be loving, I can't do it. How can I obey these commands of God when it comes to my emotions? I can try to control my behavior, and and I do that a lot, but I can't always govern those emotions. Well, here's what's important for us to realize is that when we come to faith in Christ, we start off as spiritual babies, right? You start off as infants, and then as you go and mature, you become young children. And as you get a little bit older, you become adolescents spiritually and, and young adults and finally mature adults. You see, in the spiritual life, we can't just automatically do everything perfectly, even though we'd like to. We grow. And so we behave as we should, the best we can, whatever stage of growth we're at. But we press on to grow and mature so we can do it even better. I wish I could give you some secret formula or some pill, or some three easy steps to all of a sudden being able to exercise self-control and also to be perfectly able to obey God's command to express these emotions. I can't give you one, two, three step formula to do it, but I can tell you what you do and how you can do it. You retrain your heart so your emotions become an ally, not an enemy. You see, the way you learn in order to express your emotions the way God wants you to express them, the way you are able to start thinking the way God wants you to think and behave the way God wants you to is you begin to train yourself to do it. You mean you retrain your heart. Last week we talked about how the heart of the Bible is not just emotions. The heart is a description of that inner person, which is your thinking, your choosing, and your feeling. And we need to train that heart because as we saw last week, our heart is deceitful. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. But when Jesus came and he forgave us and gave us a new heart and he gave us God's spirit, our heart begins to be renewed and changed. And what we have to do is we have to cooperate God in doing that. A key verse for this is 1 Timothy 4, 7. Train yourself to be godly. Notice that passage says train. There's this assumption there that you just can't automatically do it because you automatically do it. You would just say, be godly. But there's a sense in which it takes some training. You start at one point, you make progress. You start at one point and you do the best you can there, but you train yourself then to go to the next point. You know what training is? Training is the thing you do so you eventually are able to do something you can't do right now. You can't do it right now. You want to do it right now, but you can't do it. So you start a process of training so you eventually will be able to do that. Now, few of us here right now could run a marathon. If I was going to say, you need to run a marathon tomorrow, you'd say, no way, I can't do it. You know, I said that in first service, and we had one of our uh, online person, people watch us online from the very beginning, was with us for the very first time in person our church services. They started watching online in March, and they were with us, and they happened to be a marathon runner, so I kind of messed my illustration up here, but most of us <laughs> could not run a marathon the next day. She could, because she does it all the time, all right? But you know what you could do? You could start training. You could start beginning the process of training yourself so you could eventually run in a marathon. Maybe not this November, but just think, November 2021, if you started training yourself, you could potentially run the New York City Marathon. And if not 2021, 2022. Now, you might be saying, oh, Jeff, I'm too old. I can't change. I'm stuck in this this, this pattern, way of living. Let me show you a picture of Harrietta Thompson. This is Harrietta Thompson. She became the oldest female marathon runner in 2015 when she completed a marathon at the age of 92. 
Think about that. New York City Marathon, or something equivalent, at 92 years of age. Do you think all of a sudden one day she said, oh, I think I'm going to go run the marathon? No, she didn't do that. But you know when she started running? She had not been a runner in her entire life. She was a concert pianist. At 76, she decided that she was going to start running. Hadn't run before and started running. She didn't run a marathon her first year. In fact, she started walking fast. And then she started running a little bit, shorter distance and shorter distance, till eventually she had the endurance to run a complete marathon. I bet if I tried to run a marathon, I couldn't do what she did because I've not trained. And even though she's 92 years old, she could do better than what I could do. But I could train myself. I could begin a training process so eventually I could run a marathon, and so could you. You see, that's why these passages in Scripture are telling us what we should become, and we do them the best we can where we're at right now, but most of all what we do is we go into a spiritual training process where why we become in the future what we can't do right now, what we aren't right now. You know, uh, in our morning devotions, 7.30 a.m. devotions, we're going through Philippians, and there's a passage where Paul says he hasn't become perfect yet. He hasn't obtained everything he's talking about. But what he does do, he forgets what's behind. He forgets he's made mistakes before. He forgets he's been immature before and hasn't responded the right way. He forgets what's on behind, and he presses on toward what he wants to become. And you see, what he's basically saying is, I'm not there yet, but I'm straining to become there yet. I'm training to become what I should be. I'm pushing on toward that. Well, how do you train? How do you train when it comes to spiritual matters? Well, there's lots of things, but I'm going to talk about some broad categories of how you train. And here's the most fundamental things about how you train yourself to be transformed, how you have your mind renewed and your heart renewed. The first one is you've got to take in God's word. We take in God's word. As Christians, we are committed to the truth, and God's truth is the truth. We believe God's word. We believe that it is truth, that it is records what God wants, how God understands reality, how God works in reality. God's word equals truth, and the truth we need is found in God's word. Jesus says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, sanctify is kind of a big religious word we don't use very often. So let me read it to you from the contemporary English version. Your word is truth. So let this truth make them completely yours. You see, God's word is true. And when we're exposed to God's word, God's word transforms us, works on us, changes our heart, changes our mind, changes our will, changes our emotions. So we are completely God, completely God's truth is of first importance. It's truth that we embrace that comes and brings us to faith in Jesus Christ. The truth that we are lost without Christ, that our sins have separated us from God. But the truth is that Jesus died on the cross to reconcile us to God. And then that truth, once we're reconciled to God, helps us grow and mature. Now, there's some truths in the Bible that we kind of need to, to uh, think about and put into practice on a day-by-day -day basis. But there are some truths in the Bible that just are foundational, that we've got to have as part of our life and part of our perspective on how we live and what we do. We've got to have a solid understanding of God's character. God's good. God's powerful. God's all-knowing. He's loving. You know, these foundational truths shape how we then feel about what's going on around us. We've got to have a foundational grasp of the fact that we are saved and made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. It's all about what Jesus did for us, not what we do. I'm acceptable and I'm loved by God because that's God's character. Jesus took away my sins. Jesus is restoring me. I don't have to worry about being acceptable to God, loved by God, valued by God because I perform the right way. If I did, I would be miserable. But I can have that sense of acceptance because of what Jesus did for me and God's attitude toward me. And I also need to understand that I'm not living for now. I'm living for eternity. Life is about what's going to happen in the life to come. This is not the end. This is not the way. Jesus is going to return to make all things new. And I need to live for the day when Jesus returns, not just for this time right here. Now, that's real brief, and we'll talk about that more. But it's important for us to realize that we need taking God's word, and so our heart can begin to be remade, be restructured, renewed, so it aligns the right way with God. We also have to cooperate with God's spirit. God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, takes God's truth and uses that to retrain our hearts. When the Holy Spirit comes, he begins to enlighten us to God's truth, helps us understand it, to think it, to embrace it, to make it part of our lives. And then God's Spirit's going to nudge us to obey that truth. The Spirit will remind us of things, of God's truth. The Spirit will nudge us, and when we get nudged, we need to obey. 
Listen to 2 Corinthians 3.18. For all of us who've had the veil removed, that means all of us who now have spiritual insight and understanding because of our faith in Jesus. So all of us who've had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Notice that spirit begins to work in your life and make you instantaneously completely glorious. That's not what it says. It says he changes us more and more like him. The spirit indwells us and begins to work on us from the inside out. God's word comes in us. They cooperate us and they begin to change our thinking, our choosing, our feeling. Remakes our heart and remakes us so that we're more and more like Jesus. And then we need to make sure we cooperate with that. We need to make the right response when the Spirit tells us and reminds us of God's truth, when the Spirit nudges us. James 1.22 says it this way, Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The Word's powerful. The Spirit is powerful. And when we work with them rather than resist them, we do what God wants and our hearts are remade. Romans 6.17 but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey him from your heart. Excuse me, come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. See, transformed hearts have an allegiance to Jesus. And because we have an allegiance to Jesus, we choose to obey him, and we do obey him. We obey him in our actions. We obey him in our emotions. Now, I just rushed through that, but we're going to focus on this for the next several weeks because we're going to start looking at individual emotions and talk about remaking our heart so that we express God's desire in those areas. But I want to give you kind of like a little bit of a process so you can know how you can work this in your own life. And it's basically, it's how do we make the right response? What do we do in those situations when we're in some emotional turmoil, when, when things aren't going the right way and we're depressed <clears throat> or we're angry or we're frustrated? Well, let me give you a little bit of a way to do, respond and let me illustrate this response in some situations. Here's what you need to do. You're emotionally upset. Things aren't going well. You can see you're frustrated. You need to pause for just a moment and review the situation. Review the situation. What's going on here? What are the facts of this situation? What am I thinking about this situation? What are my thoughts about the facts and circumstances I'm in right now? What am I feeling? You know, and what is that expressing about how I'm evaluating and thinking about what's going on right now? And once we reviewed the situation, we need to renew our minds, to renew your thinking, making sure the way you're thinking about this situation reflects God's truth and what God says about it. Is there something about this situation that I should think differently than the way I'm thinking right now? Are there facts that I'm overlooking or that I'm thinking is true that's not really true? Is there something that God says about me or about life or about this situation that should impact how I think about it and then the emotions that I express about how I do that? And then respond God's way. You know, we review the situation, we renew our thinking, and then we respond God's way. How would God now like me to think? I will choose to think that way. How would God like me to behave? I will choose to behave that way. And then notice how our feelings change once we let our mind be renewed by God's truth. Now, let me give you some examples. Maybe it'll help make a little more sense if I give you examples. I'm going to start off with this example. You're sitting somewhere in traffic. Maybe you're in a car going someplace, and there's a traffic jam. Or maybe you're in a car, a taxi cab, or a bus, and the traffic is just stuck. You're not going anywhere. You're in a subway train, and it's broken down, or there's problems down the track, so you're just sitting there. And all of a sudden, the alarms stop going off inside. Your emotions are telling you that you are angry. You are frustrated with this situation. You're getting depressed because you were going to Andy's birthday party, your friend, and now because of this traffic, because of this delay, you are going to be late. You know you're upset, so you've got to stop, review the facts, review the situation. And the situation is delay is going to make me late and I am going to be embarrassed to come in late. People are going to look at me coming in late and say, what is wrong with him? Can't he get his act together enough that he could get here on time? Is he such a lousy planner and irresponsible in his actions that, that he didn't plan ahead well enough to make sure he could get here? I'm going to really feel like a loser. And they're going to look at me and think I'm a loser. They're going to think I don't even care about Andy because I'm late to Andy's birthday party. Well, that's what I'm feeling right now. Those thoughts are causing me to be angry and frustrated. So you, that's the situation. You reviewed it. Now it's time to stop for just a minute 
and renew your thinking. Now, I can't change it. You know, sometimes you can change your situation. Uh, sometimes if you're in the subway stuck, you can go up and try to get a bus or a cab or whatever. But just say you're in a situation where you're stuck there. You've got to exchange, e- examine your thoughts and change those thoughts if they're negative and wrong. First of all, does making you, being late really make you a loser? No, it doesn't make you a loser. You're, you're coming to a long conclusion about that. Does being late change the fact that God loves you and values you? and thinks that you are worth his son's sacrifice on the cross, it doesn't change that fact. What's God think about you? God thinks you're his, you're his masterpiece. He thinks you're his treasure possession, uh, possession. He thinks you're the apple of his eye. That's how God feels about you. Don't spend your time, don't let your feelings be determined by some loser who might be at Andy's party, but because they're a loser and their attitude calls you one. Let your sense of self be controlled and determined by what the God of the universe says about you and feels about you and thinks about you. And think about this. If God's really in control of everything, I have this promise that he's going to take all the events of my life and he is going to work those events together for good. I need to apply that promise, that thinking to this situation and say, how is it that God is going to take this situation, which I don't like, but which he's promised to work together for good. How is he going to work it together for good in my life right now? What is the plan that God has to bring good out of the delay that I'm experiencing right now? You see, you evaluate the situation. I'm angry because I'm going to be late and because of what people are saying. I'm going to review it. I'm going to think about it and realize that a lot of my thoughts about this are not valid. You know, I'm not a loser. God still loves me, the most important thing. God can use this. This is not the end of the world. And then how could God use this? You know, what's the right way to respond? Well, you know what? I'm going to Andy's birthday party. You know, Andy's been a good friend of mine for a while. I really, to be honest with you, have not prayed for him in a while. So, you know, here it is. I'm going to be 30 minutes late. I got 30 minutes where I can pray for Andy. And I haven't really done that much. You know, Andy's not a follower of Jesus. I've got 30 minutes here where I can pray about that. And I can ask God to soften his heart. I can add God, ask God to give me some words that maybe I can talk to him when I get there and see him. I've got some extra time here. And you know what? I'm kind of behind on my core 52 reading. I've got it on my phone right here. I can catch up on my reading, you know? This, this, this 30 minutes is a blessing. I'm praying for Andy, and not am I praying for Andy, I'm gonna get caught up on my reading. How am I starting to feel because I'm now renewing my mind and getting God's perspective? Well, I've got peace where I had worry before. I've got some joy because I'm gonna get there to, and then I'm gonna have a better attitude. I've been praying for Andy. And so what's going to happen because you do all this? When you arrive, you're going to be a completely different person. Rather than a person who's already on edge, ready to snap at somebody. If somebody said to me, you're late, aren't you? What's wrong? You know, I'm, I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to say, yeah, I am late. And I thought about not even coming because I was so late. But, you know, I want Andy to know that I value our friendship so much that even though I'm a little embarrassed for being late, he's so important to me that it's more important that I'm here to say hi than I experience some embarrassment. You know, all of a sudden... Things completely change. Your emotions change. Your feelings change. And notice how those different emotions he's having, the peace he's and joy he's having, is going to empower him and motivate him to be obedient and to respond the right way to people and do things differently. His emotion is now an ally, not an enemy. And see, that can happen to you and me. And that's how we can get to the place where we can obey those commands of God about our emotions, even though that isn't our natural response and how we might respond initially. We stop and review the situation. We renew our minds and respond the way God wants. Let me give you another example from the Bible. Psalm 73, it's one of my favorite psalms. It's not a psalm of David. Most of the psalms are written by David, but Asaph wrote a few, and this is one of his. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation, and as I read it, I'm going to kind of pause a little bit, and I'm going to kind of do the uh, review the situation, renew the mind, and respond to God to kind of see how it works there. Here it is, Psalm 73. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. All right, that's good. That's a good way to start off something. But look at it. Listen to verse 2. Listen to verse 2. But as for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. Kind of using the imagery of going up a mountain and slipping. And he's saying, I almost slipped and fell down to my doom at the bottom of the mountain. Basically, he's saying there was a time when I was emotionally messed up. These words are written by somebody. Think about this is somebody who gets to write psalms and put them in the Bible. And they're describing a time in their life when they were really messed up. They were about ready to give in, to throw in the towel, to slip. And then he goes on to say, okay, let me stop and think about this situation a little bit. What was going on there? Verse 3. For I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. Yeah, this emotion I'm feeling is envy. That's what's going on here. 
And why is that? Well, they seem such, to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. They scoff and speak only evil. In their pride, they seek to crush others. They boast against the very heavens, and their words strut throughout the earth. And so people are dismayed and confused, drinking in all their words. What, God, what does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Look at these wicked people, enjoying a life of ease while their riches multiply. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep my innocent self innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. That's how he is seeing the facts of life. And so it's understandable why resentment is building there, why doubt is rising, why he said he was almost gone. You know, it's because those are the facts. That's the way he's seeing life. That's how he's evaluating the wicked, and that's how he's evaluating himself. It's not good. Verse 15. If I had really spoken this way to others, I would have been a traitor to your people. God, I know this is really not the way to talk about this situation. I've stopped and paused, and I shouldn't talk like that. And so what does he say in verse 16? So I tried to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. He's trying to understand and have his thinking renewed and changed. He's exposing himself. Next, this is verse 17. This is key. Then I went to the sanctuary, your sanctuary, O God, and I finally understood the destiny of the wicked. It means I went to the place where I could get teaching from God, God's truth, God's word, and then all of a sudden I began to see the wicked differently. In other words, these aren't the people that are going to always have things good. It's not always going to be wonderful to them. Verse 18, truly you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. Then I realized that my heart was bitter and I was all torn up inside. Okay, he's now realizing that he's expressing his emotions because he was thinking of things the wrong way. But notice verse 22. I was so foolish and ignorant. I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. My thinking wasn't right about this situation. Their lives were not perfect. They were in jeopardy. They were in trouble. They were going down the wrong direction. It wasn't going to end well for them. My life is not as bad as I was expressing it. And more importantly, I know that my end is going to be good. Listen to verse 23. Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand, which means you're not going to let me fall. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Think about the renewal of how he's thinking about his situation in life because he stops and pauses and let God's mind, God's will renew him. Who am I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. Notice the emotional change that's going on here. My health may fail and my spirit grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But as for me, how good it is to be near you, God. I have made the sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. You see, basically what happens here is he got his emotions under control. He got his emotions back to where they were supposed to be. How did he do that? Did he just try really, really hard? No, he stopped. He evaluated the situation. He reviewed what was going on there. He then evaluated his mind and what he was thinking about it. He replaced the false thoughts about the, how well the wicked were and how bad his situation was with the true thoughts that they were in trouble, they were in danger, and he was secure. And once the thoughts were changed, his emotions were changed, and he was empowered once again by the right of emotions to be faithful to God and to honor God. You see, his emotions became an ally in doing the right thing. The music team is going to come and get ready to lead us in just a moment, but let me just say, I've got more to say about this, and we'll talk more about it over the next few weeks. We're going we're to start zeroing in on specific emotions and talking about specific emotions. Uh, it's important to recognize that you know, God is at work in our lives to change us and shape us, and he wants us to be people that have emotions, that have the right emotions, that have good emotions, that express the truth about what really is going on inside and what the world is. But we've got to respond. When our emotions are up in the upheaval, we've got to respond the right way. We've got to stop and slow down and, and to really review what's going on and make sure our thoughts about our life and our circumstance and our situation are in line with God's truth. 
And when we do that, we're changed. Don't when you come to service on Sunday, love to sing the songs. You know why? Because your emotions get realigned when you do that. You sing those words and those truths get in here and, and it changes your emotions. And when your emotions get changed, what happens? You've got strength, you've got energy, you've got power. Your emotions are now an ally. You come in down and they're dragging you down. You go out up and they're giving you power. And you know what starts with having a relationship with Jesus? You cannot have the Holy Spirit working in you. You cannot get God's truth, God's power, God's mind without a relationship with Christ. So you need to put your faith in Jesus. You need to follow him. And then you need to learn from him to retrain yourself. So let me pray for you right now. Father, we're so thankful for the way you've made us. Uh, it, it's great to be a person. Uh, but we know that greatness of being a person, of being graded, created in your image, all the joys and things you give us have been marred because sins come in the world. It's, it's warped our minds and our wills, our emotions. It's got a lot of disorder. But we're thankful that Jesus came to not only forgive our sins, but also once again restore us. So, Father, those that need to offer themselves to you to become followers, we pray that they'll do that. Those that uh, need to uh, pause and reflect, followers of yours who need to learn more about how to surrender their mind to you and have it renewed so their emotions could be renewed, we pray that they'll do that. Father, uh, I'm just going to pause for a minute and just give you some time to kind of think and, and pray to God and speak to God about what you need to do in your life. Father, we're so thankful to be reminded of your love for us. And we pray, Father, you'll help us to be people that will have the good feelings, the feelings that you want, because we've surrendered ourselves to you and we're training ourselves to have your mind, your heart, your will. In Jesus' name, amen.